joined, as we are on a weekly basis, by senior producer from NFL Films, Greg Cosell, joining us here on the show. And Greg's weekly segment presented by Scott Lawn Yard, an official commercial site work partner of the Buffalo Bills. All right, Greg, we've been waiting a few extra days here to get to this Monday night game after the Thursday night victory. <laughs> um, I guess let's uh, let's start there on the heels of uh, the Dolphins' win, the win over the Dolphins. What is your what is your take about Buffalo's offensive strategy? Two very different looking games for them offensively. Uh, yeah, I mean certainly against the Dolphins. Uh, I, I guess one thing that re- I re- really noticed, and actually in the uh, matchup show this week, I am breaking down the James Cook forty nine yard touchdown run brownie. Um, but uh, one of the things that I really started to notice, and they did it last year as well, but the six O line personnel. They've done it 18 times in the first two games, I believe nine times in each game. Um, and, uh, you know, clearly that's something that they want to focus on. And uh, obviously it's a different player this year because Edwards has moved inside to be the starter at left guard. So it's Alec Anderson. But I think this is something they're going to continue. I mean, this is, they're, to me, they're clearly making an effort to be a more balanced offense not for it to be the Josh Allen experience every week, knowing that they always have that in their back pocket if a game demands it. But I'm sensing that this is a team that's looking to be more physical with the run game. Uh, I think that's one reason they drafted Davis as well, who I think will get probably a few more snaps here and there as the season progresses. But, I, you know, I, I'd say that's probably what stood out the, the most to me against the Dolphins. It- it no question. It seems like they're running the ball a lot more than other teams, yeah. but they're but they're only they've only rushed for, you know, 120 yards a game, which is like 20th in the league or something. Why have they, why has that running game been so effective for the Bills when they're not even keeping up with the top rushing leaders in the league? You know, Steve, I don't know if look. Obviously, you want it to be really productive. That that's a given. But I would I would argue that at this point in time, because this probably is a little bit of a different commitment than they've had in the past. There have been moments, as we know, where they've really tried to run the ball the last couple of years in given games. But I think this is probably more of a foundational commitment, and it might take a little time for the production to be at you know at a higher level. But I don't think there's any question that they're looking to run the ball. Brownie, you probably have the stats. I would bet that in terms of called runs, they're probably more than 50%. Do you have the numbers? They're 57% run. That is counting Josh Allen carries. So I would imagine it's probably probably down around 52, 53% run, which is right where they were last year under Brady down the stretch. Yeah. So, I mean, this is what Brady wants. I think they want to to have more of a play action pass game with um, Josh under center as opposed to being in the gun, um, which I think is, you know, a number of teams in the league are taking that approach because quite honestly, play action is more effective with the quarterback under center than he is in the gun in terms of the impact it has on the defense. So I think that that's what they're trying to be as an offense there. It, it strikes me that they're trying to build an offense in which the run game and the pass game are married together much more. What uh, what strikes you about this Jaguar squad? Because they've got it in a bad way here. Uh, yeah. Trevor Lawrence has lost his last seven starts. The team hasn't won since Thanksgiving weekend last year. Um, we've heard everything from lacking an identity to a lack of leadership I mean, there's a ton of talent on this team. It just doesn't compute for me. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that they're not winning. I mean, they, you know, Lawrence is, is in his fourth year now. I think it's his fourth year. Is yes, it not? that's right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, he's had moments. He's obviously talented. Um, but there seems to be just an overall lack, and I hate to use this word, but it's it's true here, a lack of consistency to the way in which he plays. I can give you a couple of reasons I think that's the case. Um, and offensively, they just they, they don't seem to be able to play to what you expect the level of their personnel to be. Now, I don't think they're particularly I think they have some questions at wide receiver. First of all, they have Brian Thomas, who's a rookie, who I think will be a good player. They have Gabe Davis, who, you know, very well, who we've talked about many times over the years. I think probably at best he's a number three. That's my opinion based on <laughs> film study. 
So they, you know, they paid a good amount of money for him. Um, I don't think he's worthy of, of being thought of uh, even as a high two. Um, Kirk's an interesting player because he can line up inside, outside. They did not play with Ingram last week. I don't know because I, I know it's a hamstring injury. You never know with that. But just getting back to Lawrence for a sec, um, I think their offensive line is very up and down. And one thing I've always noticed with Lawrence, and I've actually had this conversation with coaches as well, and they see it the same way because we're all looking at the same thing, is he's a strider. He's a big kid who's a strider. So what happens very often is if you get bodies around him, he he rushes himself because he needs to stride. He's not the kind of quarterback that can just deliver the football effectively without striding. And he's long-legged, and he has a little bit of a longer delivery. So he tends to rush himself when there are bodies around him, and he misses some throws that he shouldn't make. And while he has a good arm, and I was told this by a coach who coached him, that he does not have a big arm. I think people, because of the way he was spoken about, literally from the time he was 10 years old, just assume that this kid has a gun. Now, he can make every throw. That's not the point. But when he gets pressured and there are people around him, his his arm strength does decrease a bit because he can't stride. And he does not have a natural gun like a, like a Josh Allen or a Matthew Stafford. He can't make those kinds of throws when there are people around him. So philosophically, where's Doug Peterson taking this offense? I mean, where ideally do they want to be? Oh, that's a great question. I think they'd like to be able to run the ball effectively. Um, you know, I, I really, really like Tank Bigsby a lot. And, right. and I'm curious to see how the, the snaps play out as they go forward. Because while ATN is certainly explosive, I think Bigsby, and they may have to get to this, I think Bigsby is much more of a sustainer. And and sometimes when your offense is not playing well, you just need to, you know, as you guys know, Steve, I mean, you've been, you know, you play, you, you just need to get some first downs, keep getting first downs. That's, that's the first start. You know, it's not about, oh, let's hit some 50 yard touchdowns. It's let's get some first downs. And, and Bigsby is a really good sustaining back, m- much more so just in terms of his traits than ATN. Now, ATN can certainly take it to the house any time. I think you guys, we saw that last year, right, in the game in London, where late in the game, didn't he take it to the house to put that game away, if memory serves me correctly? Um, but, um, you know, I'd be curious to see if Bigsby becomes more of a factor just to try to get their offense sort of back on schedule, some sense of continuity and stability. Most coaches will tell you if your offense is struggling to try to regain stability. You don't come out and toss it around the yard. You try to become physical and run the football. Uh, Greg, could you give us a sense as to the back end of Jacksonville's defense? The reason I ask is we know that their pass rush is pretty formidable, yet they've given up eight plays of 20 yards or more through the first two games. I realize they've got a rookie playing the nickel and Jerry and Jones, but what have you seen there that has made them vulnerable to some big plays here early? Well, I think it's a dramatic change in philosophy from a year ago. Brian Nielsen is now their D coordinator, Brownie. Yeah. He was in Atlanta last year. And Atlanta played a ton of man last year under Nielsen, and they're playing a ton of man this year. That's his coverage foundation. So when you watch them play through two weeks, they're playing cover one at times with a robber, and they're playing two-man coverage. They're playing man concepts. I think they're among the leaders in the league in terms of yes. playing man snaps versus right. quarterback dropbacks. They are so number one. Is, I'm sorry. They are number one. Yeah, I didn't. I, I I could just tell from watching the tape. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't know that particular stat, but I could just tell from watching the tape. Um, and I think it's probably taking some time because you know Campbell's been out, so they have Darby at left corner, Brown. Um, was a lower round pick. He's at right corner. And Jones is the slot corner. And they play some dime, but not a ton. All their dime is on third down. Uh, And they bring in Flowers, who's actually a really interesting player. He's kind of their movable chess piece on defense. But my guess is because they made a dramatic change from a year ago and they're playing new players, that it's going to take a little time, Brownie, for them to become better playing the way Ryan Nielsen ultimately wants to play. And wouldn't you agree that playing that much man coverage is almost suicide against Josh Allen? Well, that becomes uh, the question as to what they do this week. Yeah. Because, you know, do they play that much man? Do they continue to play man and maybe have a a spy? Um, Do they, you know, they did spy a couple of times on Deshaun Watson last week. Um, 
So do they do they do that this week and stay with with what I think Ryan Nielsen wants them to be? Or is this the week you have to reach into your zone bag and say, hey, you know what, guys? We can't play as much man as we've been playing hey. because of the quarterback we're playing against, and we have right. to play some more zone. Allen only has, in two games, he's only had 16 dropbacks against man. He's got three touchdown passes already. Yeah, so, I mean, look, obviously the Bills, you know <laughs> – Josh Allen is Josh Allen. We don't need to discuss him. The Bills have clearly committed to running the ball more, but Josh can be Josh at any given time. Um, he hasn't had to throw the ball a lot, Brownie, as you know, the way the games have kind yeah. of played out. So we'll see what happens. Um, you know, it, 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 it'll be a little different. I mean, the other thing, too, is don't forget that um, Jacksonville on offense just played a team in the Browns that plays a high, high percentage of single high coverage maybe among the top two or three in the league in terms of a single high safety. And now they're going to play a Bills team that is probably, again, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I would bet the Bills are among the league leaders in snaps of two high structure versus quarterback dropbacks. Right. It'll be interesting to see if the Bills can continue to turn out turnovers and sacks and get those, you know, those game-changing plays like they have been able to with, these, with the injuries that have happened to them in their in their on their defense. But I, I do want to ask you if if this defense of the Jacksonville comes out and tries to do this stuff with Josh and, and it just seems like Josh is just and this this offense hasn't been asked to do it. So no. do you think we we still don't know if they can come out and throw for 350 yards in this group? So maybe Jacksonville no, wants I, to find out. There's a lot of there's. I would say there's unknowns. Every season is different, and you guys know. Okay, so I would say there's unknowns for both teams right now. I, I think most people would probably agree that the Jaguars are not a bad football team when it comes to their personnel. So you know, could they come out and win this game? Of course they could. You know, Trevor Lawrence is a gifted quarterback. He could come out and be sharp and have a great game. It's not as if we're talking about a low-level quarterback in terms of talent. The Bills have had not had to really throw the ball a lot, and they're playing with a different core of receivers. So we don't know if the game demands, if Josh has to drop back 45 times, how that's going to play out. Now, we know he's a great player. That's not the point. But every week is a different week, and they haven't had to play that way through two weeks. And, you know, fortunately, they've been able to win both games. They had to come from behind against um, Arizona, and they were able to do that, really, without Josh having to drop back 45 times. And then last week was, for the most part, a pretty dominant performance. So, you know, the game played out such that, that well, I think Josh had six throws in the second half. I mean, that doesn't happen in an NFL game very often at all. So, you know, you're right, Steve. You don't, there's, there's unknowns with both teams going into this Monday night game. All around the league, where do you think – this decrease in passing yards all around the league is coming from because um, it's it's been you know nobody's yeah. throwing for big yardage I mean with that with the exception of the Saints perhaps but the whole league the passing yards are down running yards are about the same as they have been well there's probably multiple reasons for that I think one that would probably be talked about a lot is the clear increase in the amount of two safety structure that's played in the league. It's taking away seam throws. I think the league's cyclical. So what'll happen is offenses will figure this out um, over time, but you take away the seam throws. Those are often big plays. You know, when, when the Legion of Boom, which obviously had unbelievable talent and the best free safety in the league and Earl Thomas played all that single high and cover three, everybody thought, hey, let's play cover three. And cover three is great if you have Earl Thomas. But, you know, if you don't have a great post safety, you're going to give up some, a lot of seam throws uh, because it's very hard for corners to overlap, you know, and, and make those plays down the seam. So you started to see, obviously, a lot of big plays in the past game because there was so much cover three. And then people realized that we can't give up all these seam throws. And there started to be a lot more of the Fangio school of defense, which is the two, uh, two high safety structure. And that takes away all those seam throws, and now offenses are going to have to adjust. But we've seen this all through the history of the league, tactically. Everything is cyclical, and it will get figured out. It's only been two games, two weeks, you know, so we'll see. I know that uh, Gabe Davis has made a handful of plays here through the first two weeks with the Jags. Uh, are they using him in similar fashion to what we saw in his time as a Bills receiver? Um, you know, I, I – 
I haven't studied him in detail, Brownie. So, you know, I don't think, let's put it this way. I think they would like Brian Thomas to become their number one. He's a rookie, but he can run. He caught a 66 yard last week. Right. Um, he can run. Um, and I think they feel that he's the guy. And then Kirk is kind of the movable chess piece. So to me, Davis is their number three. Now, again, that doesn't mean he's not going to make plays in any given game. But I don't think he's going to be a high-volume receiver for them relative to Thomas and Christian Kirk. And Ingram, you know, is Ingram going to play this week? What, what's it, the report? The report? He's, I guess very, to... he's very iffy. Yeah, because, I mean, hamstrings. By the way, speaking of hamstrings, there have been so many lower body muscle injuries. And I, I'm i not a doctor, so Steve, don't ask me why that occurs. But there have been so right. many of them. Right. I want to ask you as well about um, this passing offense of the Bills. What do you see when they do throw it? I mean, Josh had 16 dropbacks against man, and he's had a lot. He's had some scrambles, particularly in the second half of the of the <laughs> Uh, Arizona games. We haven't seen a lot. What do you? Uh, is there anything you can discern about the Bills' wide receiver room that's notable? Um, I mean, a couple of things I think you know stand out, which I, I assume you'll see more of because that's probably what they practiced. I mean, you guys, maybe I'm wrong, but I think I think you'll see Samuel, um, who's sort of starting to be deployed as kind of a movable chess piece in the offense, featured at times as the motion receiver, lines up in multiple locations within the formation. I would think you'd continue to see that. I would think that's something they're going to build upon because he's always been that kind of player, even going back to his days at Ohio State. Um, Shakir, you know, we've talked about him since he came out of Boise State, and I told you how much I liked him. Um, he's probably at his best in the slot, but I think you can move him around as well. And I think probably in the context of this offense, he'll become somewhat of a volume receiver. Whatever that means, that's hard to know right now. And, you know, clearly Coleman, they'll work him in. Uh, we'll see what that means. I mean, he made the big catch last week, you know, on the on the fade ball. Um, I don't know if this year he'll be a high volume guy. We, you know, we don't know the answer to that right now. Um, but, you know, he certainly has the traits to be that boundary X, that single receiver to the short side of the field that can win one on one because of his size and his hands and his ability to make those kinds of catches along the sideline. But it's hard to say right now sort of what the, the division of labor will be because they just right. haven't thrown it that much. Right. What do you make of uh, Bobby Babich's ability to kind of morph and adjust to some of these yeah. player injury losses? Because there really hasn't been much drop off and you know I know Cam Lewis is kind of a Swiss army knife how impressed have you been watching him go from nickel corner to dime safety basically sometimes from one down to the next you know it's funny I said here's a note I made when I watched the tape and it was true week one but I made the note week two as well I said Lewis was a big factor in the Bills defense aligning in multiple positions in the nickel and dime packages. He played fast with a quick trigger. He saw it and he reacted. I mean, I thought he played really, really well this past week. Um, is Johnson going to be out again? Uh, yes, he, yes, he and probably. Terrell Bernard have both been declared out already. Yeah. And, and by the way, I thought Spectre flashed at times in the run game. I thought he showed some plus quickness in the box, enough inside outside range to make plays. Um, there were some plays in which he struggled to get off blocks and was driven back, but I thought overall he did not hurt the defense. So I assume it'll be Specter and Williams. Yes, that's who's going to be. Yes, yeah. And Williams is still, you know, he makes splash plays because he's so athletic. My guess is they probably still feel he needs to see it better. Um, you know, the key and diagnose part, but he certainly makes splash plays. You can see the athleticism in his game. Yeah, it'll be interesting. I. I I'll, I'll say this, this Jacksonville team, for an 0-2 team and for a team that hasn't won with Trevor Lawrence in you know, seven attempts, they won on week 17 last year with a different quarterback. But right. um, this team for Buffalo, I mean, they've had some ugly contests, these two. Like in a playoff game, it was 9-6, you know. Um, that, was ten, that was the 10-3 game. Well, game. How many years ago was it where Josh Allen, the quarterback, you know, had the bad game in which Josh Allen, the defender, that was had the, the nine inter- six game that in twenty twenty one. Twenty twenty one. Yeah, that was that, that was, was a really bad game. game for the Bills' offense and for Josh Allen, the quarterback. Yeah. And last year I in think, London, 
You know, it was 20 to 25. The London game last year was interesting. I thought, you know, that game was very reflective in some ways of the Bills' season last year, particularly early. They they kept getting off to those bad starts. Remember that last year? They kept getting off to bad starts. And it just seemed like they couldn't find their footing until like sort of late second quarter in in a lot of games. Yeah, and it ultimately led to the dismissal of Ken Dorsey. Um, Right, yeah. And that's that's why Joe Brady ended up taking over. Well, and, Calvin Ridley's not there right now, and I remember he had a very big game in that game in London. Yeah, because Greg yeah. Rousseau didn't play in that game. Christian yeah. Benford Christian Benford was out for that game. They lost Matt and Milano. And Tredavious White was lost the week before, and then in the first three series they lose Daquan Jones and Matt Milano. Yeah. So no, lost, I mean, yeah. hey, at some point, if you're going to keep losing good people, it will have an impact. And, and look, that's why it's hard to predict this game. You know, we can talk about uh, Spectre, who came in and played really well. We can talk about Cam Lewis. And, and, and no knock on these players, but they're not starting players. So there, usually there's a reason for that. And it's not a personal thing. You know, there's usually a reason. Uh, coaches play the players they think are the best players. So, you know, can these players in any given game be exploited? Sure, they can be. Th- this game... I'm sure people are looking at this game with the Bills being 2-0, and with a do- coming off a dominant win against a division opponent on the road. Um, was that on the road? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and here's Jacksonville, 0-2, not looking very good at all, coming to Buffalo. I'm sure a lot of people think this is an easy game, and you can't think that way. Right. I'm, and that's the way I'm, we're approaching it up I'm here. I'm very I mean, wary. We're, because that as as good as the Dolphins record has been and the, you know they win a lot of games they're a flashy high flying offense the Bills match up differently with this Jacksonville offense and it's not advent, it's not necessarily advantageous to go against this right. Jacksonville dof- offense rather than the Miami offense and with these with this defensive alignment with these players so you kind of have to wait till you line up to see how you're going to match up with these guys yeah, and like I said Trevor Lawrence while he's not playing great football you know he was a number 1 pick on merit and he's had big moments in this league. He can come out, and if he's super sharp, I mean, he can be 25 for 35 for 350 against anybody. I mean, right. you got, you know, it's it's not like you're playing a stiff. That's right. Yeah. Thanks very much, Greg. Thanks, we'll Greg. catch up with you next week. Enjoy the the week three action. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks.